Bri, Tanya 29. We're doing chapter 29. We're talking about spiritual EDD, emotional deficit disorder, <laughs> or uh, <coughs> emotional dysfunction. So what happens when the machine's not working? What happens when we're not functioning as we can, as we should, as we were designed to? So we contemplate, we think, we have awareness and knowledge. It means nothing to us. It does not seed or arouse emotions whatsoever. And we just, we just feel like a burned out shell. We're just not reacting to anything, which actually has a physical or material, if you will, or a psychological alter ego to this. This is actually called emotion, emotional d- uh, deficit disorder, no? Yeah. It's actually real, not, not, not ADD, EDD. It's a real thing called EDD, right? We're not talking about the uh, pharmacology, even the psychology, not in a material sense. We're talking here about now in a spiritual sense. Now, this condition is one that afflicts Bainanim, in between people. It does not afflict great tzaddikim. Great tzaddikim don't have this issue as a rule, as you'll soon see. What was the advice that the Alter Rebbe gave us? He said he paraphrased from the Zohar, which uses the metaphor of a large block of wood that is not being ignited, what do you do? Chop it. Chop it. It's too big, that's why it's too dense. And once it'll become splintered, once it becomes smaller, then we'll have the ability to use it as firewood. Then it will kindle. And so we had this idea that nishmasa, gufa de la hated nishmasa, when you have a body that seems too dense and incapable or unwilling to receive the light of the neshama, Vivacholi, denigrate, put it down, smash and pulverize the bodily reality, and then a person's neshama will begin to rise to the fore. Then the true light will come forth. Now, we talked last week about this idea that it doesn't mean that we should crush a person, but rather we should crush the klipa, the sitra achra, that surrounds the person. And when we crush or break the shell, what happens is what's beneath the shell, which is the neshama, can actually be revealed. So it's not chas v'shalom breaking the person, but rather revealing who the person really is. It sounds very nice, but practically speaking, who are we putting down? We're putting down ourselves. We're saying, well, we're putting the neshama, the, the body down. We're saying the body's repulsive, it's disgusting, it's selfish, it's snarling, it's angry, it lusts and, for, and craves for things which are totally inappropriate, so who are we putting down? We are putting ourselves down. Don't, let's not fool, let's not, like, can't fool ourselves. Who is, who, who are we talking about? God created us. But God who created us, but this is who we are. Mm-hmm. So a person acknowledges this is who we are, and he's ashamed and embarrassed of, of who he or she is. This is, this is who I am. It's, it's bad. And so these feelings or these pangs of, of remorse or pangs of shame, pangs of inappropriateness wash over a person and that serves to break the bodily and material reality and that allows the oida, the nishmasa, the light of the neshama to be able to kindle and to, to take root. But ultimately, who are we pulverizing? Pulverizing ourselves. So, so like we have to figure this out. Who are we? Who am I? Who are you? Who are we? Who, who, who is this in this story over here? There's this silly story about this guy who went to, he couldn't afford to to have his own shower, went to a public shower house, he was afraid they would forget who he is. So he decided he would tie a little red thread around his toe. Okay, red thread on his toe, he went from a shower, he went into to a jacuzzi, and there was warm water, and the red thread went off his toe and ended up at somebody else's toe. And he looks down, <laughs> and he says, I know who you are, but who am I? <laughs> <laughs> so it's a, it's a silly story, but like who, so who really are we here? Who is having these taivas? Who is having these lusts and desires? Well, this is somebody else outside of me. It's true that sometimes as a survival mechanism, people who suffer abuse, all kinds of horrible abuse, in their minds, they create this other person where they have to like make believe it's not me. Rahman al heaven prevent children who undergo physical or material or sexual abuse. This is what they, they kind of they create themselves, they, they extricate themselves from the situation. And that's profound neurosis. That's not normal. So are we suggesting that we should like kind of outer body experience ourselves? Oh, that's not me. Now who is it? <laughs> I mean, really and practically, what are we talking about here? So what's very important for us to now is to reiterate the distinction 
between tzaddikim and benenim, between ordinary people, in between people, people who are striving to try to make sense out of life and serve Hashem with some kind of consistency, and people who are tzaddikim who are literally living in a different head, heart, and soul space. So tzaddikim are people who do not have the everyday lusts and desires that we have. It doesn't interest them. For the tzaddik, the material reality is something that's superfluous and extraneous. It holds no allure. Much like, and this is just a metaphor and example because this doesn't come with avayda, it doesn't come with toil, and therefore it's not really tzaddik-like, but there could be certain things in our life which we would find abhorrent. Some people lust and crave these things. And we f might find them abhorrent. And we would never consider doing it. We, have, in fact, have no interest in doing that kind of thing. But there are people who do this. There are people who eat live animals. Mm. They actually eat live animals. They, 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 I don't know, in certain parts of Asia, they, they, they take fish, the writhing thing, and they eat them, they're writhing in their mouth. Ugh. Like, right? Yeah, I saying, uh, too. Like, you, you can't even imagine doing that. But people who actually eat bugs, they enjoy eating cockroaches. <laughs> I, can't, I can't get it. I, I can't wrap my head around it. I have no desire whatsoever to eat a cockroach. In fact, it would make my skin crawl. I don't know, if I had to do it, I don't know how I would do it. Does it make me a tzaddik? The Torah does prohibit the consumption of cockroaches. Ha, it must be such a tzaddik that I have no desire for cockroaches. Well, no, that's fine. So, so, I'm, so I'm lucky enough not to have a desire for that. I, I, I have other issues, so to speak. And people who desire cockroaches, maybe they don't like the things that I'm interested in. So that's an example of a tzaddik. For a tzaddik, everything material is abhorrent. It's disgusting. It's something that needs to be taken care of or gotten out of the way, and let's move on. So most normal people do not look forward to time spent in the washroom. That's a thing that they need to do, not a thing that they can't wait to do. It's not the high point of the day for normal people. But maybe there's people who, I don't know, this is, this is where they enjoy being, in the washroom. And make those beautiful washrooms and spend hours in the washroom. So for the tzaddik to be in whatever kind of material reality, it's like something you have to do. It's a function of the body rather than something that holds a lure and something that catches his or her attention. That's the case with tzaddikim. We're not like that. So tzaddikim, for them, when they look at the material nature of reality, that's not who they really are. And here the Altareb is going to go into something called the nefesh ativis, nefesh achayunis, the vital soul or the natural soul, which oftentimes is seamlessly enmeshed with the idea of nefesh abahamis. So for an ordinary person, the nefesh abahamis, the animal soul, and the soul that gives you life is not really separate. That is what gives us life. That's, that's the currency of life for us. Life is comprised of these moments. Now, yes, it's true. We may force ourselves to do the right thing sometimes. Sometimes we might even have a passion with doing the right thing, but that's, that's like an adjunct. Maybe that's a hobby. That's something we, we, we like sometimes. That's not who we really are. Who we really are? Well, materially minded people. And precisely because we're materially minded people, intrinsically, we can expect to deal with EDD. We can expect sometimes that our emotions won't function right. That the, the mechanism and machinery that Hashem gave us on a spiritual level, the psychoschematic of the neshama, is not going to function. And our emotions are going to be dead. And here, the Alter Rebbe says, going further in chapter 29, that the animal soul, the material soul, that gives vitality, life to the body, he betokfo, it's in its full strength, just like when it was, so to speak, born in his heart. So he didn't overcome anything. He didn't change anything. Now, here's an example of something, I wouldn't call it a tzaddik, but something that happens at least through some kind of nurturing. An observant Jew who has fasted Yom Kippur his whole life, or maybe for many years, could not imagine actually eating on Yom Kippur. Wouldn't do it. At the same time, can't say you're not hungry. You are hungry. You just wouldn't do it. I could add to the question. In fact, if somebody had to eat on Yom Kippur, it would be a terribly difficult thing for them to do. At the same time, you do crave food. Rebbe Levi Yitzchak once said that about the difference between Yom Kippur and Tisha B'av, he said, on Yom Kippur, who wants to eat? On Tisha B'av, who could bring himself to eat? We have no problem really in either. We want to eat on Yom Kippur, and we could easily bring ourselves to eat on Tisha B'av, but but you're not supposed to, so we won't do it. So even that would be like in something where a benini, 
tzaddik is something we have revulsion for. On Yom Kippur, food is not revolting to us, but we wouldn't do it. That's the Benini. The Benini has a desire, and he ever has a drive for the material, even though he will never do it. But he has a drive for it. So it said to the person, who is the person? You want to get the person's attention? Stop frying up the food, you'll get their attention. Now right away, they're, they're, they're going to turn their head. Why? Because that's who they are. But they would never eat it, it's in Kippur. That's true, they wouldn't. In fact, there's an interesting halacha that says that if a woman is fasting in Kippur, a pregnant woman, all of a sudden she smells food and she becomes, falls into a swoon and she desires the food very strongly, what you should do is whisper in her ear the Tezim Kippur. And usually, that will steal her resolve. If it doesn't, there's no choice. You have to eat Yom Kippur. You have to get these cravings. But the point is that this is something we typically would not do. We can even control the body and tell the body to stop desiring it, but that's what the body desires. So when you have a nefesh hachayunis, which is mechaya, that's what's mechaya the guf. That's what the guf gets life from. By the way, the tzaddikim don't exactly get life from the nefesh hachayunis. The tzaddikim actually get vitality from the nefesh kiss. That's what gives them chayas. That's what gives them life. Not the animal soul, not the material pursuit. So when a person is able to be magber, his nefesh kiss, when he overpowers, so to speak, creates an overpowering of the godly force. And he fights so much with the nefesh habamis until he actually puts it to rest or gets rid of it. So then he's in the level of a tzaddik. And that's very nice. Something we could hear about. It's like spiritual comics. We read about the superheroes. But for regular people, for a benini, as long as you have an urge, a desire, you're pulled in the direction of material reality, that's who you are. Nimsa comes at Salta. Al says Salta Rebbe, he, he, ha'odam atzmei. The sitra achra, the desire for the dark side, that is who we are. That's who we are. That's, 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 that, 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 that's not somebody else. That's me. That's us. So when the Benini sets out to fulfill bodily needs, he doesn't have to have uh, his boninus. Now learn a mimer for a half hour about why food is good for you. And then he'll contemplate the consumption of food. And when he finishes contemplating for a half hour how and why it's important for him to eat, probably then he's going to be able to eat. That's not what happens. What happens is I'm hungry, I want to eat. People say work up an appetite. It's actually a form of mental illness when a person doesn't have an appetite. A person doesn't want to eat. Who doesn't want to eat? Everybody wants to eat. You may control yourself, you may restrain yourself, because for whatever reason you don't want to give in to the, the, the will of the body. Maybe you want to lose weight. Maybe you just want to break your body. Whatever it may be. But to eat does not take some kind of avoida, some kind of inner effort. And now I'm going to force myself to eat. There's a silly story of this beggar walks over to a lady coming out of a fancy car. And he says, excuse me, ma'am, I haven't eaten in three days. She says, force yourself. <laughs> Now, when it comes to learning Torah, that's something that doesn't come naturally. It doesn't come naturally. A person like, like eating. So now I have to force myself to learn Torah. Why? Because I know this is right. Because I know it's good. Because I'll, maybe I'll even be happy after I study the Torah. But it doesn't come naturally to me in the way eating does. Therefore, who are we? We are the food. We are not the Torah being studied. We are the material pursuit. We're not the spiritual pursuit. The davening that we do is a challenge. The tzedakah that we give, part of us doesn't want to give it. Some of us have a bigger challenge in giving, some of us less a challenge of giving. But even giving people, they still like to spend the money on themselves better. Or if they're giving it, they want to get credit. Does everybody know that they gave the money? It's also Nef Shabbat, it's all animal soul. A person is really a tzaddik who would be pained if somebody would know that he gave the tzedakah. And just seeks and desires to do everything under the radar, doing good for the sake of good, just like you eat. You don't have to justify why you eat. You have to explain why you eat. So what about the godly soul? Isn't that an important part of us? Oh, yes, says the Alta Rebbe. But remember, in our morning prayers, which are written for the vast majority of the people, not for the few tzaddikim amongst us, what does it say? It says, Neshama shenasata bi, the neshama you placed, bi, bi means? In me. In me tahirihi, it's pure. It says the Alta Rebbe, shenasata bi, daika, you placed the neshama in me. Miklal shaha'odam atzmai, what do we see from this prayer? That the person himself, I have a neshama versus I am a neshama. Big difference. I am a snarling, creepy nefesh abamis, but I have a neshama. So the fact that I have a neshama because the neshama was placed within me means the neshama is not me, it's just that I possess a neshama. Big difference. World of difference, in fact. And this is how we define the concept of a benini. 
So where are things different? The only place that things are different, that's why for a Benini, the desire to serve Hashem does not come like a natural appetite. He doesn't have an appetite for mitzvahs. I once heard a story, again, about a Blitz of Badishva, that he finished eating whatever it was on the Yom Kippur night, and the Badishva Rebbe, and the Madrega, the high level that he was, you know, with Yom Kippur, that he, who, who wants to eat, and so on and so forth. He finished eating, and he began to pound on the table. He said, dessert, dessert. His family was dumbfounded. Levi Yitzchak Badishev wants dessert? <laughs> he said, yeah, bring me a Mesecha Sukkah. And he learned, he got up on his feet, and the whole night, after fasting a whole day, and I'm sure Yom Kippur stood on his feet a whole day, he studied Mesecha Sukkah a whole night. He finished it over the course of the night. That was dessert. No. <laughs> it's not even possible to say... I, I, may, maybe we could force ourselves to study Mesecha Sukkot and I don't know if the body would just shut off probably but even maybe we could force ourselves but that should be dessert that would be the hold the same attraction as a, as a you know a nice piece of cake with ice cream on top or whatever else it is are you joking who are we kidding <laughs> that's not who we are the Bardich of Rebbe could, could stand the next morning, uh, three, a few days later, looking a whole night uh, through the, br- the break front at the Lulav and Esrik, and then at the crack of the door and forget to open the glass and punch his hands through to grab the Lulav and Esrik and forget that the, this glass in front because he couldn't wait to, to do a mitzvah. It's not shayach for us, this thing. That's not what makes us tick. We, we, we could force ourselves to do things like this, but it's not who we are. But you go to a hungry person, you put food in front of him, and he attacks the food with vigor, and you say, wow, what a oivad Hashem. He's just trying to serve us. No, don't fool yourself. I, I told you recently this is a very sweet story with the Alta Rebbe, with the, with the guy with the kugel. <coughs> I don't know, I give a lot of classes. I don't, know what I, well, I don't remember who I said what, but anyway. So the Alta Rebbe once had a court case, a din tere. Who came? A husband and a wife, they were in a fight. The wife said, I made a the beautiful kugel for Shabbos. My husband came home, they said last week, and he ate the kugel. He ate first a little piece, and he wanted a little more. He said, it's a mitzvah. Tell me, Chaim Zochel, you have to eat before Shabbos. And he ended up eating the whole kugel before Shabbos. And the poor woman said, I, I worked so hard. I wanted to make a nice Shabbos for my family. And this, my husband, goes and eats up the whole kugel. He ruined the Shabbos for me. So the Alta Rebbe says to the guy, well, what did you do? He said, oh, Rebbe, it was so good. It was so, I couldn't control myself. <laughs> one little piece, another piece. It was, I just wanted one more piece. I, I didn't realize. Anyway, the Alta Rebbe gives him a fine. He said, no, how to do that. And, he later told the Mitla Rebbe, he said, I wish I could eat like that on Shabbos. <laughs> with the Gishmak that he ate at er Shabbos. Right? Because the mitzvah to eat on Shabbos. A- and yet, the mitzvah that the Guf has Hano from, the Alter Rebbe seems to have a hard time with. Those mitzvahs. The mitzvah that, like eating, that the Alter Rebbe didn't say, I wish I could study Torah with the fervor that he ate the Kugel. That he did. I wish I could eat the Kugel on Shabbos. And the Alter Rebbe eating the Kugel was going to the washroom. Was, uh, something had to be done. It wasn't who he was. So the only time we have something different where the neshama shenasata is not shenashama shenasata li instead of be the neshama you gave me or the neshama who I am not the neshama be you placed in me not that I have a neshama but I am a neshama that's b'tzadikim that's where the holy righteous people shebehem ulehepech now with tzadikim it's the opposite shenashama tahera that the pure soul shehinef shalikis which is the godly soul hu haadam that is the person. That is who I am. In other words, that the desires of the neshama become my desires. The craving, the yearning, the wish of the neshama is my wish. With the evil, what, what evil? The nikra, the gufam, for these people, for tzaddikim, their bodies are called besar ha'adam. They have the flesh of the human. There's the human himself, which is the neshama. And then there's the flesh of the human. Now, the Alter Rebbe doesn't really talk about the corporeal reality at all. He's talking about the psychoschematic, really. He's talking about the, the spiritual reality of a person. Right? He's talking about what a person's wants are, desires. He's not talking about flesh. The tzaddik's flesh is not different than the regular person's flesh. Body is body, bone is bone, sinew is sinew, plasma is plasma. We're not talking about that. So really and truly, what sets a person aside from an animal? Because his skin is a different epidermis, than the baboon, that's what makes him different? Because, because his body is structured different than a horse? What makes a person human? Let me put it to you differently. A human remains intrinsically different from animal remains when they find bones hundreds of years later. They can tell a difference right away. 
If you're not an expert, you know the difference of which bone is which bone. Bone is bone. They have to do tests. They figure out if it's animal bone, it's human bone. Mm. It's not so simple. If they found the, the bones of a gorilla, which looks like very much like a person, would they automatically know that this is a person or a gorilla? An orangutan? Probably not. Probably looks looks very the skeleton looks very similar. So what makes a person a person? Medaber, communication, consciousness. It's the psychoschematic of a person, not the physical reality of a person. And therefore, the Al-Tareb, when he talks about the person, he's not talking about liver and spleen. He's not talking about lungs and heart. He's not talking about esophagus and intestine. He's talking about the soul of a person. It's not about the body. The person is radically different than an animal. Of course, all animals are unique, and every animal has its interest, and so on and so forth. But really, all animals are, by and large, can be grouped together in the same fashion. They're all survival-seeking, pleasure-seeking creatures. That's what they are. There's nothing else. There is nothing else other than survival and pleasure. There is nothing else that motivates the animal. But a human being is capable of having a yearning, aspiration, consciousness, what we call self-consciousness. He's not only aware of his or her innate desires, he's aware of his or her place vis-a-vis others, social interaction. How do I look at myself, not caught trapped in myself where I can't see the trees for the forest, but being able to extricate myself from my reality and objectively or somewhat objectively try to analyze the situation. This is totally within the realm of humanity. So therefore, when Dalta Rebbe talks about the difference between people and humans, he, he, I mean people and animals, humans and animals, he doesn't talk about the physical reality. What he means here is when he talks about the flesh, he talks about the nefesh abanis. When he says nikra bisar adam, he's not talking about the flesh, literally the flesh of a person. He's talking about the fleshy elements of the person. He's talking about the material soul of the person. For the tzaddik, whose life and vitality comes only from the godly soul, that's the currency of the tzaddik's life. What motivates the tzaddik? What excites the tzaddik? What interests the tzaddik? Torah mitzvahs, nothing else. No, no honor, no glory, no sensual pleasure. None of that interests the tzaddik. In fact, it could be painful for the tzaddik. They tell a story that the Alter Rebbe was once called to receive a Sefer Torah on Simchas Torah, and the Gabai who was calling out the Alter Rebbe had a few lachaims before, maybe more than a few, and he began to extol the virtues of the Alter Rebbe. He said, "Hatzadik, Hagoen, Rashke Baha, Graben Shkobne Agoyla." He said, "The genius and the saint and head of the, ge- the whole generation and the leader of the exiles." And the Alter Rebbe smiled. He just smiled. So the next day, they told the guy to sit and you know find old books that have titles and give a series of titles. Alter Rebbe smiled. Alter Rebbe was happy. And the next day, the guy he had even more lachaim before, and he gave this endless praises for the Alter Rebbe and they thought the Alter Rebbe smiled and later the Mittler Rebbe overheard his father in the solitude of his study pacing back and forth and saying they call me a righteous saint you know a holy man genius he said ah with a deep sigh one has to accept pain with joy so it was actually suffering. It was, it was painful for the Alter Rebbe to hear his virtues. It was painful for him. So why did he smile? That's the Aveda of a tzaddik. That's a, that's a, Aveda, a different kind of Aveda. His Aveda was that th- something which caused him pain, nobody should know that it caused him pain, and instead that he should smile and he should make as if he's happy. And, 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 his, and the poor Gabai meant well, but he was giving the Alter Rebbe Yusurim. He was giving the Alter Rebbe pain. He had, he had no clue. Right? Because we tend to understand others by virtue of how we understand ourselves. So we know, what, what, what do I like or what they like? We assume that they like the same thing. And for the most part, we're right. We do more or less like the same things. We all want to be loved. We all want to be appreciated. We all want shelter. We all want freedom. We all want the ability to spend, spend as we please and go where we want. We all want the same things. Yeah, except Sadiqim. They want different things. What do they want? Oh, they want like another blot of Gemara, another Maimur of Chassidus, another half hour of learning Torah. I always joke that when the hockey game goes into overtime, nobody complains they want the money back because they were forced to stay in the seats for another half hour or 15 minutes, right? But another hour? Really? I never went to a hockey game. I know. The playoffs, okay. Don't hold it against me. It's like I'm not a real Canadian. I never went to a hockey game. <laughs>
I'm not a tzaddik, but probably for me, I think it would be torture. I have no interest whatsoever. But, but, but th- whatever, that's not because of it. It's nothing to do with being righteous. It just it doesn't interest me. It's something that interests you if you're happy to be there, if you want to be there, and then it goes into overtime. Wow, it's like you paid the same money and you got more game. Who gets excited because shul lasted a half hour longer? <laughs> Nobody. You can give your tanya for two hours. Yeah, right. <laughs> 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 Like fun. Davening was so good today, it went into overtime. We davened for a half hour longer. So who would say that? They're going to be kidding. So people quetch, everybody will quetch. I can't believe that rabbi, who the heck gave him the right to speak for an extra 15 minutes, ruined my whole Shabbos. Hello. Shabbos, does it come out till like almost 10 o'clock at night? What are you doing a whole day of Shabbos? You really saw an hour later, they're still seething. The rabbi spoke 10 minutes extra. Like, oh. But that's human nature. That's human nature. What interests people? If there's extra food at the Kiddush, they're happy. Extra sermon in the thing, they're not happy. That's human nature. Wait, wait, wait. You, want, you, want, you want human nature to be not human nature? <laughs> That's what people are. That's what interests them. So the tzaddik is called Msar Adam. Ukemaimed Hillel Talmud, that we have a very interesting Medeshaba found in the Medeshaba Vayikra on Perek Lamadalad, Parsha Lamadalad. It says like this Keshahaya Hoylech Lechel, when he would be going to mealtime, he says, let's do some kindness. Let's take care of the lone, the lonely, uh, you know, the solitary, poverty-stricken individual. Let's do some kindness with the body. Nebuch, the poor body. Okay, let's feed the body. Nebuch. It's on him. Not as that's me. For Hillel, that was somebody else. The body had pain. It didn't bother him really. But he said, you know what? Let's give the body a break. Let's feed the body already. We, 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 we've beat up the body far too much and we've focused on other things. Fine, we'll do the body a favor. We say, I'll do my neshama a favor and go to a Torah class. Hillel said, I'll do my neshama a favor and go to mealtime. Yeah. The difference is obvious, right? Like, Ki hu atzmai, Hillel himself was not just the God, it was only the godly soul. What was the currency of Hillel's life? What made him tick? What made him function? What actually gave him vitality in life? What actually gave him was, was his neshama. That the evil which was attached were part of the animal soul. Which generally speaking embodies itself in the blood and the plasma. The tzaddik, not the tzaddik, was born a tzaddik. You can only be born potentially a tzaddik. But after the tzaddik, who is potentially a tzaddik, was bo- you recognizes and develops and harnesses, nurtures that potential. So what happens is the animal soul or the unhealthy desires, the toxic will of the animal, of the, of the, of the, of the, of the body, gets absorbed into holiness and becomes one and the same with kedusha. And that's how it is for tzaddikim. However, for a regular in-between person, because the very essence of the animal soul, of the, the vital soul, the animal vital soul, which is in the blood, in the flesh, has not been transformed into what we call pure goodness, only selflessness. Instead, there's an element of selfishness. It's a real animal. So, hare, he, he, ha'odamatzme. And that is the person himself. So now we understand who the person is bludgeoning and beating up. When we say, you put, it, put yourself down, ultimately, really, who are you putting down? Sorry, you, say that again. When the we're person putting the person, the person is going to beat himself up. He's the block of wood that's got to get smashed. Get so, yeah, you got to get splintered. So who is that? It, it is ultimately us. But we are the Nefesh Obamas. And this makes for a very, this is like fraught now. So how do we, how does this not become an issue of despondency and depression? How does it not evolve or devolve into low self-esteem if we're beating ourselves up, if that's who we really are? Understand the tricky nature? That the EDD is a problem. But if I'm beating up the, uh, beating up the Nefesh Obamas, I'm splintering the wood, I'm crushing this block, this density that refuses to allow the light of the neshama. But who is it? Ultimately, it is me. So how do I walk out of a session of self-flagellation inspired? 
It's going to drain me of any kind of self-confidence. It's going to take away all my self-esteem. I just beat myself up. I just said I'm a horrible person. Well, if I'm horrible, then who cares about anything? So this is not a simple situation now. For a tzaddik, it would, make, it would be very easy. Actually, it wouldn't be easy for a tzaddik because a tzaddik has nobody to beat up. But again, the tzaddik hardly ever suffers from any kind of EDD. That's not the tzaddik's issue. The tzaddik's issue is, is being even more emotional, going beyond the call of duty, having an even more intense Avedi Shem experience, but not, not responding. The non-responsiveness is primarily a Benini concern. And this puts us into a, 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 like a pickle almost. Like We have to figure this out. So how does this work? I just want to finish off by like invoking the, the, the notion of, of um, you know, Frankel's logotherapy where he talks about having meaning in life, right? So what actually makes people live? The average person would intuitively think that Abraham Maslow is right. What makes people live is biology. What makes people live is food. What makes people live is shelter. What makes people live is having their material needs taken care of. That's what makes them live. That's what life's about. It's nice to have meaning in life too. But, but Frankel said, that's just not true because I was in the camps and the camps people had no food and the camps people had no shelter and the camps people had virtually no social life they had none of the things which people live from and yet the difference between those who lived and died was meaning not necessarily godly meaning not necessarily faith but meaning meaning that people imagine to themselves Victor's own meaning was his wife he, he lived to meet his wife again, who, unbeknownst to him, had already died. Had he known that she had died, he, wouldn't, he would have died. He would have lost hope. He lived, he was motivated, self-motivated. That was his meaning. That was his meaning in life. So it's, it, it, the point is that when we say that a person actually lives from the material reality, and we talk about a tzaddik who lives from a spiritual reality, so the tzaddik is living purely from spiritual desire. A person could find all kinds of meaning just because meaning is not a, a, a salami sandwich doesn't mean that it's not earthy or materialistic. First, people could find anything could be meaning, the point is meaningful. The point is that that is what gives a person life, that gives a person animation. It could be a person who lives for fame. It could be a person who lives for power. You take away their power and they just die. They die of a broken heart because the whole reason they live, they live for power. All the food in the world doesn't keep them alive. So there could be various other forms of, of, of meaning that will keep a person alive, that will, will get a person going. The bottom line is, all of that is still Nefesh Bahamas. It's all still animal soul. Whether it's biology or psychology, it's all animal soul. It's all selfish. It's self-oriented. But the tzaddik lives from selflessness. He lives only from Hashem. Because the tzaddik isn't. The tzad, the self doesn't motivate the tzaddik. Not selfishness or re realization of self is irrelevant. The tzaddik is in a state of bittel. And because the tzaddik is in a state of bittel, this whole EDD problem will never come to him. The whole EDD issue is an ego issue. It's a klipa issue. So I know we're kind of in the middle of a situation. So he, um, the spiritual, one that does not know spiritually, cannot live like that. No. Because you have to even we who do know something about spirituality, even we who do understand that we're learning Tanya, ultimately it's not who we are. That, that's not what motivates us. That's not what keeps us alive. Another mitzvah. What keeps us alive is whatever. The things that are meaningful to us. Things that are important to us. The tzaddik lives for different reasons. And, and actually, like the Altar talks about in that famous letter, the famous epistle of, of where he talks about the chai ha tzaddik enum chai sarim. The tzaddik doesn't live from a material life. Which doesn't mean he doesn't live from, from, from food. Of course, Sadiq has to eat and sleep too. The body will collapse eventually. That's not the point. That's not, what, that's not the motivation of a Sadiq. That's not what make, makes a Sadiq live. The Sadiq lives purely from closeness to Hashem. The Sadiq lives a life of real bittal. We live a life of selfishness. So, so the problem is when you're taking that wood, that block, and chopping it, who is it? It is us. But how, do we, how, do we, how does that work? How do we get away with it? So if it is us, why doesn't it ruin our self-esteem? Why doesn't it make us depressed? And I think we, this is a problem we haven't yet worked out that is um, Hashem to be continued. Thank you.